So welcome, welcome everybody to Voices of Wentworth. Um, my name is Kath Nation. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and by paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We are a community organisation concerned about the erosion of democracy in Australia and the detrimental effect that this is having on a number of issues, most urgently climate action. Our aim is to promote democracy, accountability and transparency in the political process. And we are working also to shift the tone of political discussion away from polarised viewpoints towards a stronger focus on what we all share in terms of Australian democratic values. This is our third town hall session and our previous sessions are available to watch via our website at www.voicesofwentworth.org. We're privileged to be joined today by Anthony Wheelie QC and Safon Zoma, who will be talking to us about their work, followed by an interactive Q&A session. So as I said, please type any questions into the chat or you can ask them directly at the end if you prefer. But first, a quick run through the key elements of a healthy democracy and some of the areas of concern for Australia. So what does democracy mean? Essentially, it means government by the people where supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation. This usually involves periodically held free and competitive elections to establish rule by the majority. All citizens are considered politically and legally equal and generally enjoy a high degree of individual freedom and civil liberties. Australia's democracy has recently been downgraded from open to narrowed and trust in government is at an all time low. Some of the key elements of a healthy democracy include free and fair elections, checks and balances, free press, accountability, transparency and the rule of law. Human rights protection is another element and I personally became more engaged with Australia's political environment due to the issue of offshore detention of refugees, which I personally felt ashamed by as an Australian citizen. So looking at elections, in 2019, Clive Palmer spent $83 million with the goal of defeating Labour and preferencing the coalition in the federal election. Separately, voting booth signs in traditional and simplified Chinese characters stating that Liberal was the correct way to vote were intended to appear like official AEC core flutes. A false labour death tax campaign also gained significant traction on Facebook. Currently, Australia has no law against misleading and deceptive advertising for political campaigns, nor are there any limits on campaign advertising spending. So one question here is whether favouring small numbers of wealthy candidates undermines democracy. Branch stacking is when members of political parties are recruited to local branches to influence internal pre-selections of candidates. Media concentration. Australia's media ownership concentration is amongst the highest in the world and dominated by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp and Fairfax Media. This situation gradually evolved following the abolition of various media rules by the Labour governments in the 1980s. News Corp takes a firm pro-liberal anti-Labour position throughout its news outlets and has widely promoted the idea that climate change is a hoax. Despite this, the Australian government has significantly reduced public funding to the ABC and actually given public funds to News Corp. So given the concentration of media ownership, does this situation impact free and fair elections? accountability of elected representatives and even government decision-making. Free press. In June 2019, the Australian Federal Police conducted raids on a journalist and the ABC relating to news stories published more than, more than a year earlier. There was a public and global outcry at this overt attack on press freedom. And the government's response was not reassuring for journalists or whistleblowers seeking to inform the public on matters of public interest. In a healthy democracy, the public has a right to know what governments are doing in our name. If journalists live in fear, they cannot do their important work. 
Rights to protest. Recent protests have raised a serious question about the role of police and how they conduct themselves at such protests, with several instances of alleged use of disproportionate force by police against peaceful protesters. Here we have the Prime Minister with two directly opposing views on two different groups of protesters. On climate protesters, he described them as a new breed of radical activists who were, had indulgent and selfish practices. But in relation to state anti-lockdown protests, he said, it's a free country, people will make their protests and their voices heard. Since the 9-11 terror attacks in 2001, Australian parliaments of both Labour and LNP governments have passed at least 82 national security laws, allowing governments to hide information from the public without explanation. Last week, the Australian Law Council objected to an attempt by the government to hold secret hearings in the prosecution of lawyer Bernard Colliery and his client, Witness K, under national security laws. It said this offends the principles of open justice and tilts the balance too far in favour of protecting broadly defined national security at the expense of the rights of the accused. Political donations are viewed as a way of buying influence and this practice, as well as the lack of transparency surrounding it, is a cause of increasing concern for the voting public. The confusing lack of policy from the government on energy and COVID recovery stimulus spending is widely viewed as being inextricably linked to the successful lobbying of these groups over the interests and wishes of voters. Which brings us on to the rule of law. The rule of law means that all citizens and organisations, including governments, are subject to and accountable to the law, which is clear, known and enforced. The judiciary is independent and resolves disputes in a fair and public manner. Presumption of innocence, access to justice, freedom of speech, the right to assemble and the right to a fair trial are all concepts relating to the rule of law. Two ministers have recently been rebuked by Justice Geoffrey Flick for ignoring court directions, but both ministers are still in their jobs. In January, the National Audit Office reported that public grants of money had been disproportionately directed to marginal and targeted seats before the last election. Minister Mackenzie subsequently resigned. In May, new evidence showed that lobbying for $100 million of so-called sports grants included requests from Scott Morrison's office. The evidence showed that his office had asked Senator McKenzie to seek Morrison's authority for intended recipients of sports grants, which directly contradicted his previous claims in Parliament that he had no role authorising the intended recipients of the grants. Morrison subsequently denied misleading Parliament. Dave Sharma has urged caution about creating a judicial body which supplants the decision making of elected representatives and has pointed to the existence of the Audit Office as an oversight body. But the role of an integrity commission would be to investigate abuse of power and corruption, not to review decisions of elected representatives unless they were corrupt. Further, the Audit Office recently requested additional funding to do its job but instead, the government announced $14 million of cuts from its budget, which surely makes the case for an integrity commission even stronger. The Morrison government announced its proposal for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission two years ago and subsequently promised to deliver the commission at the 2019 election. The government's proposal was broadly criticised for not having teeth. Despite indicating in January that the draft legislation was all but complete, it has still not been released. In the meantime, the crossbench gained support in the Senate for its National Integrity Commission bill, but the government has blocked that bill from proceeding to a vote in the House of Representatives. In these circumstances, the perception that the government will not allow a vote or introduce its own legislation because it is deliberately avoiding scrutiny of the actions of its ministers is very hard to avoid. In relation to reduced parliamentary sitting days, Liberal New South Wales MP Jonathan O'Day has said, it is in the public interest for Parliament sittings to continue, not only to pass any urgent legislation, but to allow the opposition and crossbenchers to question the government and hold it to account for the action it takes at such a crucial time. A National Covid Commission 
at a time when Parliament was not able to sit and scrutinise that decision. The issues around the COVID Commission, its remit and purpose, and the interests of the representatives selected to advise the government are a separate issue of concern relating to the transparency of government processes. So how can we ensure that our parliaments continue to operate smoothly and effectively and remotely if necessary in a crisis? This slide references a number of examples where the current government lacks proper accountability. In relation to COVID, the government has been exposed as not implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission into aged care and having no aged care plan when COVID struck. Avoiding or ignoring Royal Commissions is a worrying sign of lack of accountability. Government officials were also blocked from appearing at a recent inquiry into the Ruby Princess. As just one example of inequality, there are three men for every woman in the current government. According to ABS statistics from 2016, 52.1% of Wentworth residents are women and the median age is 37. The recent federal budget has been widely criticised for leaving women behind. So there are a lot of benefits to upholding a healthy democracy. The generations living in Australia today have grown up protected by democracy all our lives. Every year, we honour the Anzacs and the many who died fighting for democracy. So it's important for us to remember the sacrifices made and continue to work to uphold this tried and tested system of government. But I'll hand over to Anthony now. Anthony is the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity, an independent think tank dedicated to preventing corruption, protecting the integrity of our accountability institutions and eliminating undue influence of money in politics. A former justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court of Appeal, Anthony brings a wealth of experience and insight and we are honoured to welcome him this evening. Thank you, Kath. And uh, thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to speak to the supporters of Voices of Wentworth. I'm delighted to be able to be present with you. Um, <clears throat> Kath has given us a very comprehensive guide and I hope you don't mind if I uh, just travel over some of those areas myself, uh, perhaps with, a, with a, a, a slight different emphasis, but overall, I agree with everything she said. They're all very, very important areas uh, in relation to our quest for a continuation of democratic principles in Australia. The Centre for Public Integrity was formed uh, two or three years ago, uh, just three years ago, really, and uh, devoted, as Kath said, to uh, research, education and advocacy. Uh, we are, as it were, endeavouring to prop up the pillars of democracy as best we can. And there are three specific pillars we've concentrated on. I mean, there are so many areas here uh, uh, that uh, maybe in due course we'll get around to all of them, but the three in which we've mainly con uh, concentrated our efforts are one, the defence of our integrity institutions. And by that, I mean a very wide group of bodies, uh, Parliament itself, uh, the integrity bodies that protect us against corruption, the courts, uh, the media, our published broadcast, publish, uh, public broadcaster, all, all these organisations are part of the integrity foundations that uh, mean we can operate our democracy in a better way. And the uh, second area that we have concentrated on, I won't have time enough tonight to develop it, but Kath did uh, uh, mention it, and that is removing the corrosive influence of money uh, in relation to donations and electoral expenditure. It is really a fundamental breach of democratic principles that someone with an enormous amount of money uh, can get uh, into the political sphere and influence it, whereas we mere mortals uh, can do not much more than hold a sausage sizzle on election day and hand out pamphlets and uh, we don't achieve the same. And, and it's that disparity, I think, that is most concerning for us. We don't have uh, an effective donations control system or an electoral expenditure uh, control system uh, at federal level. It is such a shame because I think the states for the last few years 
have been in, endeavoring as best they can to have a, quite an act of reform in these areas in Queensland, New South Wales, but not so federally. And I want to make one other point right at the outset, and that is the Centre for Public Integrity tries not to be partisan. We want to be apolitical. And if we appear to be criticising the government, it's merely because the government has been in power for a long time. And there are many aspects of what happens in government at the moment that cause us concern. But we would be equally as concerned uh, if it were the Labor Party uh, or any party really in the political sphere that was um, acting in the way that we find um, worrisome. And the third area where we've concentrated our advocacy is in pressing for an effective anti-corruption agency at a federal level. I've been personally involved in that for about five years now. And sometimes I stare out my window looking at the water. I live down at Kirribilli and I despair that we're ever going to get anywhere. Uh, I mean, three years ago, neither of the major parties wanted a federal uh, anti-corruption body, but generally the Labor Party came around to it and they now espouse it quite, uh, quite vigorously. But the coalition has not, and I'll explain why and the problems there when I come to that point. So they're the three pillars. And in relation to the first, that is the protection of proper parliamentary processes, I think that there are three aspects to that. First, parliament must sit. We can't have a situation where parliament refuses to sit. Secondly, parliament must legislate. I'll develop that in a moment, but the point simply is that we have too much delegated legislation and we have too much power in the hands of the executive rather than in the hands of parliament. And thirdly, as a kind of corollary to all of this, uh, we see uh, that there is a complete lack of accountability shrouding uh, what's been happening, for example, over the last eight months uh, since the pandemic hit us with the um, what's called the National Cabinet and the National COVID Commission. Now, concerns there are not so much that we have those bodies. Uh, the National Cabinet was very effective to start with and the National COVID Commission, I don't think is a bad idea, but the trouble with both of them is that they're shrouded in secrecy. In other words, the so-called National Cabinet um, has a blanket put over it by the coalition government uh, asserting what's called cabinet in confidence. Now, the notion of cabinet in confidence is a historical idea, goes back quite a few hundred years. But what it means is this, that it, it's not mentioned, for example, in the Constitution or anywhere else, but it's a kind of tradition that means when the Prime Minister and his close ministers get together, they're in Cabinet and what they discuss there ought to be privileged and not revealed because ultimately they'll produce some legislation and then the public can look at the legislation and decide whether they like it or not and the Members of Parliament can decide whether they like it or not. But the idea of Cabinet in confidence is that what happens in that room between the Minister and his senior ministers should be confidential. That's been historically so, and it's, it's, it's fair enough. But the trouble is what's happening now is that these other bodies are being cloaked in the so-called cabinet in confidence. Just take the national cabinet, for example. The national cabinet is not the minister, the prime minister and his ministers, it's, it's ministers uh, and premiers from all around Australia of different political persuasions. So it can't possibly fit into the description of a cabinet so as to obtain a cabinet in confidence protection. And the National COVID Commission is, is, is well, it's a, it's, a, it's a mass of people from the private world, corporate world and public servants, but it's nothing like a cabinet. And so, and, and of course the prime minister knows that but he has, by calling it the uh, COVID Commission advisory body, he says, oh, well, it's providing advice to Cabinet, so we can't tell you what that advice is, and we don't want you to know anything about it anyway. So you can see how artificial these concepts are becoming. 
so, but coming back to um, the first point about Parliament sitting, we all know that it was difficult at first when the pandemic hit. I think it was reasonable that the Parliament suspended activities, but it did remain stagnant for too long. And so it was really months on end with very little Parliament sitting. Uh, and uh, the coalition had to be dragged over the line, really, to agree to a virtual parliament, uh, even though in other countries, particularly the United Kingdom, uh, that, that had been going on since the start of the pandemic, um, with even the situation where voting on legislation was being done virtually. Now, that never happened in Australia, and I can understand that. We, but maybe if the pandemic had gone on further, we would have had to face that issue. The second issue uh, that I've mentioned is the fact that uh, there's too much executive lawmaking and not enough lawmaking by Parliament. We've seen executive lawmaking double over the last 30 years. For example, in the last year, uh, delegated legislation pieces uh, soared to 1,738 in that year compared to 872 30 years earlier. And that's been increasing all the time. So what is delegated legislation? Well, normally it takes the form of regulations that are published. So it's not an act of parliament, but it's a regulation published under an act of parliament. And regulations have an, an important part to play, but they should normally be dealing with supplementary matters, um, catch up matters. Uh, they shouldn't be devoted to huge issues of policy uh, and what we've seen is that, that that's exactly what they are at the moment. Just let me give you a couple of examples. Um, the uh, one in the appropriation bills of 2020, $40 billion was advanced to the fin finance minister to enable him to distribute that according to his discretion. So that is a worrisome uh, feature. Under the Biosecurity Act of 2015, the Health Minister was given uh, the power to extend emergency periods and to determine how we should live and function within those emergency periods. Um, you can understand at the outset of the pandemic why such a, a, such a, a power was thought to be perhaps appropriate to put into the hands of the Minister, but uh, as we look back on it, we realise that it's Parliament getting rid of its responsibility and delegating it to the executive. Now, the other point I want to make, I mean, there are many other examples I could give you, but time won't permit. Um, it's, not the, it's not the existence of these powers, but it's rather the concentration of the powers in the executive, in the minister, that is worrisome. Now, regulations uh, can be scrutinised by the Senate, uh, but the Senate's really only interested in what might be described as technical matters. They're not interested in the policy underlying the regulations and the exercise of power in the regulations. And you might be interested to know, uh, because I don't think many people do know, that regulations can be uh, disallowed by the Senate or by either House of Parliament for that matter, but the Legislation Act of 2003 provides that regulations may be declared exempt from disallowance. And even more worryingly, the executive itself may declare regulation exempt from disallowance. So that means under our system, which is lawful, a regulation can be put out which gives the minister enormous power and neither the Senate nor anyone else can disallow that regulation or the exercise of that power by the minister. And um, in, since the pandemic began, um, of the various legislative uh, pieces that have been put before Parliament, uh, it, I think it is fair to say there's something like 293 federal instruments made since February this year, nearly 20% of them are exempt from scrutiny and disallowance. And they include the two examples I've already given you of the health minister and the finance minister. 
And finally, on that point, there's no formal body to protect or to investigate or comment on these executive decisions because we do not have a National Integrity Commission. So that really leads me to the to what I think is the final matter that I would like to deal with, and that is the need for an effective anti-corruption body uh, in this country. Uh, um, Kath's already pointed out that polling on this issue revealed that over 80% of Australians thought that such a body was necessary. And if you don't know it already, I should tell you that every state and territory has such a body and they function overall quite effectively. And I believe that they have an enormous uh, influence at state level uh, to bring about better behaviour. We can't eradicate corruption. It would be foolish to think we could. And the events in New South Wales recently, well, there's one every year really, uh, demonstrate to us, I think, that we, we, we at state level, we clearly need a, a body that's able to investigate, educate, make findings and make them public so that everybody knows what proper behaviour is. And all of that helps, I think, to protect the situation. But it's ludicrous to think that once we cross the border uh, into uh, the federal sphere, that suddenly poor behaviour, bad decisions, inappropriate influence and in these things disappear. They don't. Uh, I'm quite sure that they're all there. I remember when we first started arguing about this, uh, the then Attorney General said, well, there've been no findings of corruption in the federal sphere. So that proves there isn't any corruption. It's a bit like Donald Trump saying, if we didn't have testing, we wouldn't have coronavirus. Uh, and, and really it's the same point. The, the more effective a body we have, the more it will uncover corruption. Now, um, as it stands, both political parties support a federal uh, anti-corruption body, but regrettably, uh, as Kath has already pointed out, the, uh, the coalition government have been uh, seriously dragging their feet in introducing uh, legislation. Been going on for a couple of years now. And, and I think honestly, they don't want it. They really don't want it, even though they say it's part of their platform. And if you say, why, why don't they want it? Well, the answer is not that you know, individual ministers are corrupt or that uh, there's enormous secret dealings going on in, in Canberra. It's not that, they do not want to be scrutinized. That's what it is. They look around and see the examples in uh, states and territories and they say, well, we don't want that here. And then that leads them to argue they don't need it there. And the final argument they put forward is, oh, terrible things have happened in state uh, independent bodies, and we certainly don't want that happening federally. So they've introduced a model, and the model is seriously flawed. Uh, many commentators, not just myself, but many, many commentators uh, have said that the model uh, put out by Christian Porter uh, is, to use a rather cliched expression, a toothless tiger. Um, I think it's more, more of a pussy cat, quite frankly. And uh, I'll just tell you very briefly, if you'll just give me a few more minutes, why that's so. First of all, there are two tiers to this model. One deals with law enforcement officers like federal policemen and border control uh, police or, or officers. And that, that tier of the government's model is not too bad. It's a bit similar to what exists at the moment under what's called ACLI, the, um, the body that already exists for the law enforcement officers and the like in, in the federal level. But the second tier deals with uh, the ministers of the government, uh, with parliamentarians, with bureaucrats, with staffers and the public service. And this model is the one that is extremely flawed. And uh, first of all, it has an impossible threshold. Uh, this federal anti-corruption body proposed by Christian Porter cannot investigate a matter unless they are reasonably satisfied that a criminal offence has occurred. Now, it only just takes a minute's reflection to know that 
if you uh, have a complaint made to you about some inappropriate conduct, you couldn't possibly be reasonably satisfied that a criminal offence had occurred because you haven't investigated it. But because that's the threshold, you can't investigate it. So that's absolutely ludicrous. The New South Wales ICAC and other ICACs around the state um, can um, have a look at things, even where there's an anonymous tip off. Um, I happen to know some of the statistics about the New South Wales ICAC, and that is that many, many thousands of complaints are received each year, but only a tiny fraction of them are uh, go beyond the initial investigation stage. And that's because uh, bodies with experience like this are able to perceive when a, a false complaint's laid or a frivolous one or a malicious one or just a mad one. And so with that experience, they weed out and, and finally get to the ones that require investigation. So one, impossible threshold. Two, it's confined to criminal behaviour. Now, anybody who's had anything to deal with corruption knows that there are plenty of, uh, plenty of areas where there's uh, uh, what might be called corrupt conduct, um, which, which is not criminal. Uh, we've only got to think recently of the sports rort scandal. Uh, nobody could at this stage say that anything criminal had happened there, but clearly there was a misuse of public funds on one view of it, and that misuse uh, was motivated by a desire for political advantage. Uh, well, you know, I suppose you could conceive of that being a criminal offence, but not necessarily so. But nevertheless, it's the type of conduct that the community normally deplore and condemn. And, but yet under this model of government, it could not be investigated. Similarly, with the purchase of land at Leppington, that's been referred to $30 million purchase for land worth 3 million. Uh, on the face of it, you can't see a criminal offence there. Uh, it looks just like maladministration, but maladministration when investigated can often be found to be an instance of corrupt conduct. So there are but two examples of matters that are not criminal in nature, but which obviously would require investigation if we had a federal body. But under the government's model, they couldn't be investigated. There are some other criticisms too. Um, no ability uh, to hold a public hearing, uh, no ability to make a public report if corruption is found, no ability for whistleblowers to lodge a complaint, uh, no ability uh, for, any, uh, for any person in a department to lodge a complaint about misbehaviour in the department. The complaint must come from the department itself and no ability for the independent body to initiate an investigation uh, in its own right. Uh, the Eddie O'Bead case is often given as an example uh, where an anonymous tip-off led to investigations into the involvement of politicians uh, in a mining venture uh, in New South Wales that finally led to uh, a very significant uh, corruption finding. <coughs> I just want to say one other thing about public hearings. This is the one thing that we've seen happen in New South Wales this week. Some people I think have, have been critical of that, uh, particularly uh, I think uh, uh, one of the writers uh, for the Australian, Chris Merritt, and the well-known commentator, Alan Jones. But I would have thought most Australians would think that it was appropriate for the public to know what was being alleged against Mr. Darrell Maguire. It, it was very important that that be aired in public. It would be um, a colossal um, mistake for that to be hidden, not only from the public, but from the politicians themselves, who when they see that sort of behavior and see it being exposed in that public way will make them think that they themselves mustn't fall into this terrible danger uh, of using their power as a politician to advance their own financial interests. And the fact that the Premier was drawn into it, uh, I think was done fairly and appropriately because it was, a, it was appropriate to see whether the Premier uh, knew about Mr Maguire's dealings or not. 
But the public inquiry did not trespass further than that. It didn't go into the personal relationship in any salacious or inappropriate way and was careful to deal with um, communications between the two of them in a private session. So I, I think that I think most Australians would think that was appropriate. Not that we're interested in gossip, but I think the uh, issue about um, Mr. Maguire's financial dealings and the knowledge of other politicians, and including the Premier, with whom he had a special relationship, were valid matters for public knowledge and public debate. I think if you were to ask the Premier of New South Wales what she thought, she would admit that she's deeply embarrassed and ashamed, but I think she would support the fact that the public were told what was happening. Uh, I mean, after all, it would be a very dangerous thing if that inquiry had shown us Mr. Maguire what he was up to, but had kept secret itself the fact that he'd had this relationship with the Premier and therefore uh, raised the spectre of whether uh, he was... Um, sharing his financial dealings with her. On the face of it, it appears he was not in any meaningful way. But uh, I think that it was an important issue and it should have been made public. The uh, uh, politicians uh, say that they wish to protect the unfair reputational damage to individuals that we've seen in the past. Uh, I would query whether that is a justifiable stance. Clearly, protecting reputation is terribly important but there are ways and means you can do that and still hold public hearings. And I think in the main, at present, the New South Wales ICAC is doing that well and other, other bodies around Australia, Victoria, Queensland and so on. So there are the things I've had to say. I'm sorry I've taken a bit too long, but uh, I feel very strongly about these things and our, our Centre for Public Integrity will continue to do its best to advocate uh, for the protection of our institutions in the way in which I have described. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Anthony. Um, that was really very interesting to hear from you in some depth um, on those issues. And I'm, I'm just going to move on now to introduce Saffron. Um, Saffron is a lawyer, a campaigner and a political strategist with um, more than a decade of experience leading law reform campaigns and prior to the Australian Democracy Network, she was a government relations manager at the Australian Conservation Foundation. She spent several years living and working in the US where she held a range of campaign and government relations roles. Yeah, so thank you. Like Anthony, I want to say thanks so much for having me along. I'm uh, from a project called the Australian Democracy Network, which is even younger than the Centre for Public Integrity. We just launched in March. Um, it's a collaborative project that's hosted at the Human Rights Law Centre in the Democratic Freedoms Unit there. Um, and I really came to this work from over a decade of um, advocacy and campaigning in the climate space and just coming to realise that... Um, there were systemic drivers of these problems we were trying to solve that we weren't addressing, um, and particularly our economic system, which incentivizes, um, you know, climate and environmental destruction, and our political system, which just isn't able to deliver what we need. It's not able at the moment to put people and planet at the center, even though that's what it's meant to do. So um, became really interested in that problem. And I've done a lot of research to set up the democracy program, program at um, the Australian uh, Conservation Foundation and then starting this new project as well. And the thing that has been most striking, um, doing a whole bunch of different stakeholder interviews, it doesn't matter who you speak to, whether they're trying to, um, you know, get public health outcomes or work on climate or it, better education, whatever it is, people nominate the undue influence of a big corporate lobby as one of the key things that is stopping them from getting outcomes on their issue. Um, and obviously, this is something that both Kath and Anthony have already touched on. Um, but it really stood out as being a universal block to progress on pretty much every issue that matters most to all of us having a good life. 
Um, and, and also that uh, fixing that and making our democratic system work better so that it can deliver for us would unlock so much potential for progress across every issue that really matters. Um, so the, the model of the Australian Democracy Network is to bring together organisations that have an interest in democratic issues so that we can share resources and strategy and increase our impact right across the board. Um, and a key focus of that work is, um, is this problem of corporate capture, which is um, what Anthony referred to as the effect of money in politics. I like to use the term undue influence because I actually think it's bigger than money and there are a range of levers that um, that can be used that are definitely facilitated by money, but are the big, bigger than it. Um, so can I just get a, an indication, is corporate capture a term that people know and use or is that new language for folks? Kind of, yeah, some mixed, mixed bag, some um, sh shake, some nod, some kind of in between. Um, so people use corporate capture or sometimes state capture or regulatory capture to describe um, what happens when a powerful special interest is able to exert so much influence on um, democratic institutions and decision makers that they can essentially capture the apparatus of decision making and get the outcomes that suit them. Um, and there's a few different levers that um, can be exerted to, um, to achieve corporate capture. Um, a key one is relationships. Um, so lobbyists who can be up at Parliament House having meetings constantly, um, cash for access dinners where you can um, pay $5,000 to go for dinner and sit down with the minister, um, things like perks, tickets to nice events, hospitality, hosting fundraisers, all of these things mean that um, the corporate lobbies can have enough access, repeated access, which money can facilitate, that they have these very long standing relationships. And I've even heard um, that some industries have a presence on university campuses and begin grooming student politicians even before they actually have any power. So they're really investing in these long term relationships. Um, you also might have heard of the revolving door where staff from industries move into political offices and sometimes also so-called independent um, boards and commissions. And so then of course, they like have this internalized loyalty and perspective of the industry that they came from. It should be very unsurprising to all of us that these independent commissions and tribunals would make decisions that favor those industries. The revolving door goes the other way as well so that when ministers retire, they can take a well-paid job as a lobbyist for the industry that they were just regulating, um, which you would only imagine functions as a strong incentive for them to be nice to the industry that they're supposed to regulate while they're in the job because they could lose their seat any any election year um, so there's this whole range of different ways um, and then if you add on top of that the ability of these corporations or corporate lobbies to make million dollar donations to election campaigns um, and also to spend significant amounts of money on election campaigns independently in their own names then you just have this whole range of ways in which these um, special interests can exert power on decision making processes. And you know, we are a pluralist society. So there's nothing wrong with special interests lobbying for their position. The difficulty for me is that um, we a healthy democracy means that we all have a say, right? We're all equal in a democratic system and we should all have a, a fair and equal voice in issues which concern us. And if I can afford to drop $5,000 to go have dinner with the minister, um, then I'm probably in a much better position than any of the rest of you on the call to um, get the minister to listen to what I have to say. It's just not fair. Um, and what generally happens is that the, the industries that have the, the most to lose, it's, uh, it goes by the name of the polluters paradox. So if you make money by selling a product that harms people like tobacco um, or guns or gambling or drugs and alcohol or coal and gas, um, then it's only right for a good government to regulate you to protect the public health and public well-being and people from your products. And so those industries have the greatest incentive to spend money on capturing political decision makers because they make money off selling harmful products which should be regulated. And so the dirtiest industries wind up dominating politics in a way that completely warps the outcomes. And that really explains why even though almost... Um, 
how, how long has it been now since a clear majority of Australians wanted more action on climate? Several years. Um, and it's clearly in the public interest because Australia is at risk from all kinds of extreme climate impacts. Uh, they're happening now, it's not a risk, it's a reality. And yet our political system cannot deliver because our decision makers have been captured by special interests who stand to lose if um, the public interest is, is served in that way. Um, so I just wanted to um, put that out there. Um, that is a, real, um, a really big problem. But it's also one that uh, we think is solvable and we're in the development stage of a, a really um, exciting campaign, I think, to um, create a package of best practice integrity reforms. We're not touching the ICAC because Anthony and colleagues at CPI have got that completely covered. Um, but we are looking at a range of other reforms in the campaign finance space um, and around lobbying and revolving door, um, something around misinformation potentially, and maybe protection for advocacy so that peak bodies can continue to do their work and not be gagged by governments. And actually, um, Anthony, we're speaking to your colleague, Ju Chong, to get his input um, next week. So we're talking to the experts first so that we have a set of policy proposals that we think is really strong. And then we'd really love to um, invite all of the community organisations that have an interest in this space to help us co-create what a big coalition campaign to create pressure to pass a package of integrity reforms that could start to fix these problems could look like and really use the run up to the next election to um, make this an issue that a lot of people are talking about and build some public pressure and support. So that's me, Kath, back to you. I assume you're gonna facilitate some Q&A. Um, I feel like I said plenty. Yeah, thanks so much, Saffron. Um, again, really fascinating to hear from you. And it's just, there's so many things that we could talk about. I might actually pass over to Eliana if that's okay, because I think she's been keeping an eye on the questions in the chat. Um, so we've had we've had a lot of discussion in the chat, me included. I'm finding this so fascinating. <laughs> For Sylvia, who, who asked this in the chat about, um, is she, has she been naive to this or is it just getting worse? And I think in part, it's a bit of both. Um, I, I think we've just assumed that our democracy is there and we've just we've we've thought that um, it would be super unlikely to see a whole heap of these issues unfold and it's quite overwhelming when you actually when it's actually staring at you in the face. Um, one of the questions that, um, you know based on all of what we've discussed, um, by definition are we really a democracy? I think constitutionally uh, we are a democracy. I don't there's any doubt about that. Um, and legally we are uh, in every respect. Um, in fact, you know, uh, we've been regarded as one of the, uh, the great democracies of the world. Uh, we've got one of the oldest parliaments in the world. Uh, we've got one of the oldest court systems in the world. Uh, so there's no doubt I think you can say safely that by definition we are a democracy. And the only challenges to it are, are the practice of it. And I, you know, for my part, I would say we're we're much in a much more satisfactory position than many other countries, uh, but that only means we have to cherish the notions of democracy uh, even more dearly uh, than we have in the past. In terms of representative democracy, it, I often hear people say to me, "Well, we've we've elected the government, and it's their job to to govern." And one one issue that I have with that is is this idea that. Um, that a party is elected to govern and, and that there's there's a lack of accountability between individual federal MPs and their constituents, which it seems to me that that's, that's a bit of an, an issue where constituents don't feel that they're being represented on the issues that they care about. Um, and that's, as we've seen in Warringah, has been a big issue for on the point of climate action um, and a number of other issues. And the, the gay mm. marriage vote was another one. Um, and climate action is something that people do overwhelmingly want to see in this country and, and are not getting. So that strikes me as an issue with, with, with a really key issue that has certainly activated a lot of people um, to ask the question of whether we're, whether we're li really living in a democracy when those issues are not being mm. properly addressed. The next question, what chance do we have for a federal ICAC? I think... Um... I think we have every chance that uh, one will be uh, uh, there in due course. I, what will have to happen is the government will have to bring forward its legislation. Uh, it will be debated in parliament. 
it'll be interesting to see what happens in the lower house. Uh, I, I believe there's every possibility that one or two uh, government uh, members may cross the floor and vote against it. Uh, in its, in, if, if it is in the form that the previous model uh, indicates it will be. And I think that uh, even if it were to get through the lower house, then I think it, it won't get through in that form in the, uh, in, this, in, the, in the upper house, in the Senate. I think the backbenchers are uh, strong and resolute in standing up for an effective ICAC. Just to add to that, like, I do agree. I think it's on the cards. We'll have to get it eventually because that's the way the political wind is blowing. Um, but one of the things that we need to do as we um, pursue getting that strong ICAC, even if it's not quite as strong as Anthony wants, but one that's at least not a paper tiger, is is to think about like what else we need to do at the same time to build a culture of political integrity in Australia so that these kinds of shenanigans just become less acceptable. Um, and I think that that's, that's partly like a big community campaign that needs to happen that mm. can um, really usefully surround the work that's happening in the legislative space to, to get this to happen, either, you know, this government, next government, whenever it winds up happening. I agree with Saffron. I think if the community don't support this notion of an effective uh, body and get behind it and make their voices heard, then uh, the prospects of getting a decent uh, anti-corruption body uh, become less certain. Probably just taking it to Wentworth um, and thinking about sort of the position that we're in, what are the types of things that we could be doing to help people understand that it's... Um, they, they need to be involved. And those that know Dave Sharma would say, well, he's advocating for climate change. So, you know, what's the problem? Um, and so people think, well, they're being heard. Um, he's, he's saying the things that he needs to, um, that, that we want him to, to say, but yet the things that um, he says is not what he's doing or nor is the part, rather the party. So how do we help people just better engage to ensure that what they want to happen is really happening? <laughs> That we do have such a high level of media concentration here that is very strong on its messaging. So unfortunately, those issues about the statements that are made by MPs and what they actually then do in Parliament about how they actually vote, those messages are harder to get across to voters. So again, that's one of the things that you know we're trying to just to raise the level of transparency about what is what's actually happening in in the lawmaking um, arena. And a Probably a discussion that we should carry on within Wentworth about what we can do to raise that issue about, of, you know, lovely to have Dave and all his platitudes about the issues we care about, but irrelevant because they're completely in contrast to his own party. So thank you, mm -hmm. Safran. And, you know, it's just such a great discussion. Uh, Anthony, thank you for your incredible expertise. Let's keep talking. Yeah, okay. Well, I second that. Thank you, everybody, for joining thank us. Thank you. There will be um, another town hall sometime before Christmas, we think towards the end of November, and we're hoping to make it a little bit more lighthearted next time. But thanks very much again to everyone and um, stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank everyone. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Good night.